Um, I, I was supposed to come and talk to you, uh, I forgot when it was, it was early in the summer, um, and I had to pull out at the last minute, so I apologise um, again for, for, for doing that, and, and thank you for the invitation to come back, um, even though I pulled out, out before. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm going to talk about something slightly different to what I was originally going to talk about. Originally I was going to talk about um, general thoughts on the sound money debate, um, and now I want to talk about a specific um, proposal um, uh, on banking reform. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how banking reform is becoming increasingly um, popular. Um, we're starting to see discussions of banking re reform take place in more kind of mainstream um, places. Um, I'll give some thoughts about, um, about narrow banking in particular, um, which has become a little bit more popular now. Um, but then I'll, I'll present essentially the, the, the plan that I propose um, and then talk about that in light of the, the recent Carswell bill. Um, which I'm, I'm assuming most people are familiar with, um, but if not, I'll, I'll stop me, and, and, and if I need to provide more detail of that, I, I will do, and I'll talk about how what I'm talking about differs somewhat to that. Um, so I'm assuming that most people were aware that recently Mervyn King um, made a speech in which he talked about narrow banking and, and, and expressed his support for narrow banking generally. Um, he referred to the current banking system as possibly the worst of all possible banking systems, um, and that got a lot of head, headlines. Um, it's important that we understand um, that the Mervyn King generally is is favourable towards narrow banking, and he's he's made similar speeches before he was governor of the Bank of England and since. Um, on October thirty first, two thousand nine, um, he made a speech where he talked about he advocated narrow banking explicitly. Um, the Economist picked up on that and talked about some alternatives to narrow banking, um, things like mandating that banks had higher capital ratios. Uh, making sure that banks had living wills, um, making sure that banks had catastrophe insurance, uh, creating higher fees for lender of last resort services, um, and windfall taxes on bank profits. And so this is the whole kind of debate. Um, and I think the important thing here to realise is that this debate is moving away from monetary policy um, towards monetary regimes. And for me, this is fundamentally positive, um, because the biggest difficulty at the moment um, is to get trapped by this debate about what scale of quantitative easing we should have, for example, rather than have a debate about whether quantitative easing as a policy tool is appropriate. Mm. So we're starting to see this movement um, from policy towards regimes, um, and we're starting to see this in fairly high places, um, as I say, the Governor of the Bank of England included. The one thing to realise, though, is that when Mervyn King talks about narrow banking, um, and he actually goes against things like fractional reserve banking, He's really trying to take the focus away from the things that he controls as Governor of the Bank of England. Uh, what's notab noticeably absent in his discussion about the problems inherent in the banking system are what most uh, free market economists would identify as being the main problems. Things such as legal tender laws, um, such as the monopoly of base currency, the fact that there is a government-backed lender of last resort, the fact that we have deposit insurance, um, and bank regulation. Um, I often point out when we talk about bank regulation, it seems to be kind of conventional wisdom um, that there was too little regulation. Um, I don't think in this audience we would find anyone that would say that any industry has too little regulation. Um, but what I often say to people that, that make that claim is, is, is list three other industries that are more heavily re regulated than finance. Um, and once we kind of talk about health and possibly education, um, I don't think there is any industries that's more regulated than the banking industry. But those points I've just read out were kind of noticeably absent from uh, Mervyn King's list of, of things that are wrong with the banking system. And I think the reason for that is that they are the core of the current banking system. They're the core of the system that we have uh, with a centralised um, Bank of England and a nationalised currency. Uh, now, I believe that we actually kind of, as, as, a, as a free market movement generally, I believe that we missed what was a constitutional moment to get across banking reform proposals during the financial crisis. Um, I think it did take a lot of people by surprise. Um, and when it came to the actual policy debate about how to respond to that, um, there, was a, there was a lack of, of, of plausible um, free market alternatives. Um, the one that seems to be emerging um, that many people within the free market and libertarian movement are latching onto um, is the general idea of narrow banking. Um, and this is why lots of people in the movement were very um, encouraged by Mervyn King's comments about it. Uh, personally, I think that this is misleading. Uh, Can you just define what narrow 
banking. Sure, yeah. So when we talk about narrow banking, what we're essentially talking about is the separation of deposit taking within a bank and financial intermediation. Um, the simplistic way of, of viewing this is essentially um, saying that, that, that banking institutions are unable to finance speculation um, with deposits. So there needs to be a very, very clear ring fence of deposits within a bank um, and the intermediary activities that it does, the loans that it gives out, the kind of the, 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 the relatively riskier activities. Um, now, my arguments against this, firstly, I'm not aware of any evidence um, that Glass-Steagall would have prevented the crisis. And Glass-Steagall is seen as the kind of the, the, the typical narrow banking act that, um, that separated investment banks from retail banks that was repealed in the US prior to the crisis and which many people are using as an example of why we need to go back to that sort of regime and find institutions similar to that. As I say, I'm not aware of any evidence that, 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 that splitting these banks, um, the big investment banks, would have presented the crisis. I also think it's a fairly populist idea um, to dictate how banks should operate. Um, so the narrow banking alternative um, suffers from what Hayek would refer to, I think, as the fatal conceit, um, which is people having a fairly clear idea about the type of activity you are trying to implement. Um, so whereas, whereas narrow banking kind of sounds good in, 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 in theory and intuitively it kind of sounds nice to separate the risky activity from the safe activity, um, I think this is a kind of a dangerously populist uh, notion. Um, the main reason for this is I think it, it kind of hideously underestimates the notion of risk and misunderstands the concept of risk. Um, and note that in this the idea of risk and ignorance uh, are very much tied together. Generally speaking, um, if there is risky activity, I think it's appropriate that we confront it. Um, so I don't think it's appropriate to try and protect people from risk. I think that risk and, 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 and ignorance generally are things that we need to confront and we need to deal with. Um, another reason why I think this is important is because when we try to reduce risk, um, what we tend to see is that it shifts to other places. So this is a, a, a sociological argument as much as an economic one. Um, but whenever we see people that, or certainly whenever we see um, politicians that, uh, and policymakers that deliberately try to reduce risk, um, I would posit that all we, all we do is transfer risk um, to other places. Um, and the problem, the problem with this is that often it, it, it transform, transforms it um, to less transparent places and it becomes less obvious. Um, the other thing is that we can't design regulatory systems that cope with innovation. Almost by definition, if we could anticipate um, future innovation, then it, it ceases to become what we would call innovation. Um, so the idea that we can create some kind of regulatory regime to cope with future innovation in the banking system um, is misguided. We simply don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, any attempt that we make to, for example, protect against risk and to bundle up risky activity and to make a definitive judgment about what constitutes risky activity and what doesn't, um, I think misunderstands the concept of financial innovation. So with that in mind, because I think that narrow banking, generally speaking, is, is, is too simplistic, um, the proposal that, that I would um, present and suggest um, is based mainly on um, the work of Kevin Dowd um, and also Richard Salzman. Um, and what I've attempted to try to do is make it slightly more palatable. Um, so when they've proposed it in the past, it's been in, in kind of pamphlet form. Um, and I've tried to really kind of simplify it as a, as a, as a, as a proposal that people can really latch on to. Um, so what I do is essentially say, OK, the next time that we have a banking crisis... No, I'm not saying that this is something that should be adopted today. I'm saying this is something that should be adopted when we are in the eye of the storm and when the, when the crisis is, 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 is actually occurring. Um, and the reason why I think it's worthwhile putting this together is because there will be another crisis and, and, and we as a kind of community need to be better prepared for that and have options on the table that we can implement. Um, and essentially the, what, the, what the proposal does um, is it says that there's three phases um, to how we should respond to this crisis. Um, the first phase is to make sure that over, and, I, and, and, and Kevin Dowd points out that this could be done possibly over a weekend, um, so this should be done over two days, in other words a very, very quick time scale. Um, is to try and establish that all operating banks are solvent. Um, note that one of the problems that we face with the crisis that we've just been through, um, you would have thought that the primary aim of the, of the response to that crisis would be to establish which banks are solvent and which banks aren't. By offering bank bailouts, by injecting liquidity, we are masking over this issue 
Um, and it's certainly clear that some banks are better positioned than others. Um, but we still have, I think, no clearer idea about which banks um, are full of toxic debt now um, than we did when the crisis um, was occurring. Um, so how do we ensure that all operating banks are solvent? Well, step one is to remove deposit insurance. Um, this is probably the easiest way to establish whether or not a bank is solvent. Um, if we say that banks will not be able to rely on government support to gain the public's confidence, then in order to gain the public's confidence, it has to rely on its own business model. Um, so remove deposit insurance. Step two is, to, to, is for the Bank of England to close its discount window. So the Bank of England um, ceases to offer emergency support to banks. Um, state that any company can freely enter the UK banking industry. I think this is a very important step because when the crisis hit, we knew that it was often foreign-based banks such as HSBC um, and possibly Santander that seem to be more robust than banks such as Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, and so we want to make we want to make sure that other uh, foreign banks are more able to deal within the UK market. Um, a corollary of this step four is that banks should be able to merge and to consolidate as desired. One of the fears is that banks get too big and this creates kind of um, microcosms of, 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 or concentrations of risk. Um, but if you look at the history of US banking, I think when US banks were able to open branches across different states, this demonstrates that, um, that, that large scale in banking can spread risk um, and can serve customers better. So we'd suggest that we'd move, um, we'd, we'd allow merge, mergers and consolidation. And then step five, hopefully, um, basically the, these actions um, would then mean that some banks are unable to continue. So what do you do when any normal business has a faulty business model and is unable to operate insolvency? You essentially go through bankruptcy proceedings. Um, so in order to take these bankruptcy proceedings on insolvent banks, um, you would, I would, I would suggest you would suspend withdrawals to prevent a run. Um, so you would, again, this is why this has to be done very quickly because you would suspend withdrawals. I think it, it is possible to make this more politically viable um, to ensure that deposits up to a certain amount are ring fenced. Um, so we went from thirty thousand pounds worth of deposits being um, being backed by the state to fifty thousand um, pounds, and I'll come back to this point later. Um, but I think that this is an, imp an important way to make this viable. Uh, you'd then write down the bank's assets. You would perform a debt for equity swap on remaining deposits. Um, and you would reopen the bank with an exemption on capital gains tax um, so that the idea then is that the bank is now open as a, as a going concern. There will be investors in the bank that have taken a large capital hit. Um, but this is as it should be because this is what would happen in any other, other industry that faces this type of problem. Um, note that these acts I don't think would create a crisis because by definition um, you would want to implement this policy proposal when there is already a crisis undergoing. Um, the second phase of the plan um, I would suggest should take place over a period of two weeks or so and this is um, so step one is to ensure all operating banks are solvent, step two is to monitor the emergence of free banking. Um, what institutions do you need in place to have free banking? Um, I think you need to permanently freeze the monetary base. So whatever the money supply is, the, the, the base money supply, you would freeze it. You would then allow private banks to issue their own banknotes, um, which would probably originally start off as operating similar to commercial paper. Um, it would be up to consumers to choose whether or not they hold those notes. Um, I think it is important to mandate that banks allowed depositors to opt into a 100% reserve custodial account and I think to make this viable, um, it is important to mandate that so that banks do offer this to all customers. Um, I think it's also important to mandate that banks would offer um, fractional reserve accounts and make public key information. For example, the reserve rates, the asset classes that the banks are using to, to back their deposits, the compensation that they would offer in the event of a suspending payment. These are all the types of mechanisms that free bankers tend to rely on to say, hey, fractional reserve accounting, um, fractional reserve banking isn't such a bad idea. Um, but I think that in a transition policy, you would want to mandate that that is publicly available and that the general public are able to view it. Um, you would also, I, I would also suggest that the government must sell off all of its gold reserves and therefore allow banks to issue notes that are backed by gold. I think it's important that you don't go back to a traditional gold standard 
um, where you kind of lock in gold as being the the the, um, the base currency, so that banks can choose to 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 back their notes with any commodity that they wish. Um, as a part of this, government would need to rescind any taxes on the use of gold as a medium of exchange, so that it is operating freely. Um, and then the, the final step in this part is to repeal legal tender laws so that, again, people are able to choose which currencies they wish to accept as payment. That would take place over um, a kind of a moderate period of time. Uh, finally, the third phase, um, which I would suggest takes place over two months, is to abolish central banking. If the previous steps have, have taken place, um, then I think you can then um, get the Bank of England to cease its open market operations so that it no longer finances government debt um, and that you ultimately privatise the Bank of England so that it, it may well remain as a central clearinghouse um, but it would be owned privately and subject to competition um, from entrepreneurs that may wish to replace it with an alternative clearinghouse. Um, so that policy proposal is deliberately intended to take place over different time phases. Um, over two days, you're, you're attempting to make sure that operating banks are solvent and that the ones that are insolvent go through bankruptcy proceedings as quickly as possible. Over two weeks, you'll be allowing free banking to emerge. Um, and over two months, um, you would put the nail in the coffin of central banking. Um, obviously, this sounds radical. Um, let me quote Hayek. 300 years ago, nobody would ever believed that government would ever give up its control over religion. Perhaps in 300 years we can see that government will be prepared to give up control over money. Now, as I said, um, there's a similar um, discussion, and there is a discussion at the moment, about different monetary re regimes. Um, the Carswell Bill is a, is a, is a bill that was presented um, under the five-minute rule by Doug Carswell MP um, and supported by Steve Baker MP. Mm -hmm. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the key aspect of that bill is to um, make custodial accounts very easy so that general, the general public um, can put their money into a custodial account. Their main concern is, is essentially a narrow banking concern in that, um, in that banks at the moment are able to use people's current account deposits um, and, and to lend that out. Um, their concern is that if those loans go sour and if everybody wants to remove their money from their current account at the same time, then as we all know, this would lead to a bank run. Um, what they want to do is to make it physically impossible to have a bank run by making sure that all demand deposit accounts are held 100% reserved in a vault. Um, now, the interesting part about that bill um, is that it also um, gives scope to fractional reserve banking um, so it's not necessarily a 100% reserve banking proposal and it's not really a fractional reserve banking proposal. It is a kind of um, a middle ground, which I think is important um, and useful. Um, but the comments that I'd make are, firstly, one of the key arguments that supports um, their, their, their proposal is the fact that at the moment the general public don't understand the nature of banking. Um, so to many people, they think there's an inherently kind of fraudulent nature involved in banking um, because the claim is that the general public do think that their money is available on hand should they wish um, to withdraw it. Um, the argument is that the general public don't realise um, that in actual fact if everybody went to their bank to try and redeem their money um, there wouldn't be enough to do that and there would be a bank run. Um, my concern with this is that I think public ignorance issues generally aren't sufficient um, for policy reform. Um, there's a kind of a paternalistic um, instinct that I think comes out in the bill, um, which is essentially saying that because the public don't understand banking, we need to protect them from it. As I said before, I think if people don't understand something, um, you want to expose them to it even more um, so that they do understand it, so they do have incentives to actually think about it and to, to wonder what's going on with their money. But on top of this, I don't think we need to worry about whether the public understand the banking industry um, in the same way that if you are... Um, if you're buying a car, for example, it's not important that customers understand how engines operate. Um, the whole point is that car companies kind of choose you know, a mixture of engineering um, techniques um, and then present all of that in one bundled package and customers can choose whether or not they wish to purchase it. Um, it, sh it th there is a danger that you become um, too prescriptive um, by mandating what type of car um, uh, what type of engine car companies need to place in. Similarly, there's a danger you become too prescriptive if you mandate the type of bank account that banks have to offer. 
So as I say, I don't think public in, public ignorance um, is sufficient on this on these grounds, um, and I also don't think it's important. Um, that the public do understand how banking systems operate. Um, what is important is that there's competition um, and that people are free to choose what types of account they wish to, to take. Um, now, the good thing about the bill is that there was part of the bill which talked about an end of deposit insurance. And I think this is where the focus really needs to come in. Um, and I think this is where there is scope to latch on to the general kind of public debate. Um, and to possibly make free banking ideas more palatable. As I said before, um, it used to be the case that £30,000 worth of, 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 of current account deposits um, were protected by, this, by the state. Um, I still don't understand why that's not sufficient to avoid any bank runs, because I don't understand why anyone would have more than £30,000 sat in a current account. Um, it's very easy to open a new current account. So even if you're the sort of person that wants to have lots of money in a current account, you, all you need to do is, is have two current accounts and split your money and, 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 and you're still covered. Um, so it's not clear to me why kind of, you know, that creates a problem. But during the banking crisis, this was increased to £50,000. Um, now, this was done as a temporary measure. So I think there's an opportunity here um, to have the public debate about the removal of these temporary measures that were adopted during the financial crisis. Um, so if we, I think that there is a general kind of public sentiment, which is um, that there is, a, there is too much life support for banks generally, um, and, and, and there's public support to take that away. Um, I think that you could present these ideas in that context and say we are now removing the life support to the banks. Um, we gave out these essential kind of bailouts to banks so that they could be reckless, and, and, and if, if there was a bank run, then you know, the taxpayers are going to, um, to bail them out. So we say we're going to remove that. The problem with that is that then this creates, you know, because of the public ignorance concerns, this may create some kind of panic because the public are very scared that they're going to lose their savings. Um, well, here's the demand for a custodial account. So the biggest kind of debate between people that advocate 100% reserved accounts, i.e. bank accounts that, are reserved, that, that have all of the deposits held in cash in reserve, um, and the biggest debate is that if you do that, you can't offer an interest rate on those deposits because, by definition, um, all the bank is doing is providing a custodial service and, and a safekeeping service, so you'd actually have to pay them. Um, so the idea is, where's the business model here? As long as you've got instant access accounts um, that are paying interest on reserves, there's no kind of business case to offer a custodial account. Um, well, now we do see a business case for a custodial account because if we think that the public are going to be concerned about the removal of these uh, of deposit insurance, and then I think it's plausible um, that you know if there is any market demand for a custodial account, it will exist in this case. So I think it's important that, that you that you adopt them. Um, okay, you know, depending on the audience I'm talking to, I kind of change my position on this. Um, given the audience that I am talking to, I'm going to kind of try and be controversial. So I'll say that you could you, you could well mandate that banks offer these custodial accounts. Um, so you could mandate that every bank in the UK um, offers a free custodial account, which they promise they will not lend out and that the money will literally be sat on a vault so that there's zero, de zero danger of a bank run. Um, when you go to any um, bank account online at the moment, you've got kind of a, a list of options to open up new types of savings account and new types of um, term deposits and all these various things. It would be incredibly quick and easy just to have another button on that website that says open a free custodial account and you can sit in your armchair and within five minutes put as much money as you want into this 100% safe custodial account. Um, and you could also mandate that banks publicise their key data that they have on their fractional reserve accounts so that people are uh, kind of are free to choose um, and they have the information that they need to choose whether or not they put their money in their custodial account and not earn a return or whether they put their money in a typical current account. Um, they accept that that money's being lent out and if everybody wants to take it back at the same time, it won't be there. But they realise that there's a low probability that that will happen and in the meantime they get an interest rate. The more I kind of think about this, the more I think, well, you know, given that so many banks in the UK at the moment are kind of effectively owned by the taxpayer, you don't really need to mandate this and you don't need to intervene in private banks because all you can do is say that the government run banks should offer this as a service. Um, and then, you know, if there is a business, if there is an actual market demand for it, then that's just a source of competitive advantage um, for those banks. Um, so given that kind of since I wrote this, 
um, so many banks are now government run. Um, you don't necessarily have to mandate this um, and force private banks to do it. You could just say this is a policy that we think that the, 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 um, the, the state-owned banks should offer as a way of moving us to a free banking environment. Um, okay, so just to summarise, um, I do think that the, the, the public debate at the moment is wide open and there's a lot of public interest in understanding more about the banking system. Um, the financial crisis was a fantastic opportunity to try and get some ideas across. There have been some people, and I'm, I'm kind of relatively young, so I kind of, um, you know, that, that's my excuse for why I haven't been going on about this for 10, 20 years or so. Um, but, you know, there have been people that have been going on about this for 10, 20 years or so, and, and there's literature uh, in Libertarian Alliance literature um, that shows that people have been making these arguments, um, and there have been people warning against the problems within the banking system, um, and the kind of the 100% the, the reserve and fractional reserve is this you know, wonderful debate that we have back and forth. Um, but the bottom line here is that everybody in the free market community generally um, agrees on the key sources of the problem. It's the central bank, it's the deposit insurance, um, it's the fact that we have a nationalised um, banking system um, with a monopoly issuer of currency. We would all recognise that if the banking system was any other market, um, you know, take the shoe market, if the shoe market um, meant that you know there was a there was a building in in, in, in th on, on Threadneedle Street in London, um, and once a month you know six people would sit in a committee room and decide on the price of shoes um, and spend you know half an hour and then go and have lunch, um, we would all kind of recognise that that is liable to create um, problems in the coordination of the shoe market. Um, I think the general public kind of understands enough about basic market theory to realise why that won't work. There is this kind of fundamental issue where it comes to money that people, I think, just automatically equate money with capitalism and therefore assume that because we're talking about money, it's therefore necessarily kind of free market or something. As soon as you point out to people um, that the money, money is controlled by a nationalised central bank, it's a central planning agency, it's a Soviet-style planning board, um, then I think people kind of latch on to that and I think that there's a, you know, that people are increasingly thinking of it now. So this has been a vindication for those of, um, not necessarily myself, but, but those people within this general community um, that have been warning against these problems in the banking industry for a long time. Um, I do think that we missed the opportunity to really get some reform proposals out there and to get the general public um, to understand what the solutions are. Um, but the increasing way in which we're kind of muddling through at the moment and not solving the root cause of the problem means I think we are destined to repeat it. Um, and I just hope that, that when that time comes again, there are more kind of plausible policy uh, reforms um, that we can propose and that we can, we can actually adopt and hopefully um, take the state out of money um, and in doing so have a free market of money. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. every one of your uh, uh, proposals in terms of what needs to be done to get us to a free banking system. I think you had, you said, uh, the removal of uh, government support for the banks, the removal of regulation, allowing insolvency, uh, eliminating central banking, and ultimately getting a free banking system. All, all those are uh, plainly desirable. What I find Curious, I think I completely, I completely disagree with you. Is the suggestion that we can leave all those proposals until the weekend of the crisis? Mm. Because if we leave all those proposals until the weekend of the crisis, nobody will listen to us. I would have thought that what we have to do is to be working on the arguments many, many years as mm -hmm. hard as we can, so that when the crisis comes, we are able to say. This is what we've been saying for a very, very long time, and mm -hmm. hopefully by then people will be listening. If they haven't been listening, then they will listen. But just to turn around on, on the Friday and say, ah, <laughs> here's all our schemes, I don't think people will listen. And indeed, I mean, the fact is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, well, no, I, I, I've made a point. Yeah, no, I think I agree with you. Um, you know, this isn't something that I think I, I'm suggesting we kind of just put in a drawer and then and then and then kind of bring out um, when that happens. Um, 
we, we, yes, we constantly need to be making the case for liberty in every market. We constantly need to be chipping away at the integrity of the Bank of England. We need to be pointing out the mistakes that they're making. Um, and we need to build that climate of opinion so that free market ideas become, become um, more plausible. Um, the, 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 the kind of, my motivation for doing this, though, um, was that I think that we can kind of underestimate the extent to which there was chaos and gen genuine um, panic amongst central bankers um, during during that, that kind of relatively short period of time, where they were where they, they were groping around for ideas. QE kind of came out of I wouldn't say nowhere, but this was a fairly this, this was an incredibly radical um, policy um, that was kind of latched onto because you know we're in a crisis and we've got no ideas and what can we do. Um, and I'd like to be able to kind of in that in that position that I wouldn't be in a position to do that, but I'd like to think um, that you know the next time that happens and people are just trying to find things that they can latch onto, um, that some of these ideas will be um, you know will be available and possibly dismissed, but at least available. Um, that was kind of the the eye of the storm type proposal. The the Carswell bill is what we do from now, which I think is the more appropriate question. Um, and what we do from now does rely on, you know, a general kind of campaign um, in, in terms of educating the public, educating politicians um, and, and, you know, build it, building a, a proper campaign. Um, so I would kind of differ the order to some. So some of these ideas I'm making are kind of time dependent. And it's, the key thing is the solvency issue. I differ the order in that if we are going to say, what should we do from today? Then I think removing... Um, uh, removing kind of deposit insurance immediately um, isn't isn't the best thing to do from from today. If we're going to do a kind of a more gradual reform and try and build up consensus, um, then what we'd want to do is to kind of mandate, make sure that these you know d custodial accounts are in place, and then withdraw the deposit account. I have one response. To that. Mm. I, I would have thought that that's the worst possible thing to do. If we want to make sure that insolvent banks. Uh, are demonstrably insolvent and are allowed to go bust. Surely we need to be getting rid of the support structures now in anticipation of what will happen and to be arguing for that. To turn around at the weekend and say, right, well, we're worried about the solvency of lots of banks, so let's make damn sure that they all go insolvent by taking away uh, de deposit insurance and yeah. take away the, the supporters. Uh, you'd have your head torn off unless you laid the ground in advance. But if you laid the ground in advance, then you won't need to be doing it then because it would already have been done before. Yeah. So it, in a sense, either we've won the debate mm -hmm. before we get to the crisis, or I'm afraid the, to put forward the proposal, having not previously won the debate on the Friday, I, mm -hmm. I just can't see that working. So where I'm getting to is I sort of feel that having detailed proposals for what to do on Friday, Saturday and Sunday is a bit of an intellectual waste of time. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to decry what you're doing, yeah. uh, but I think it's far more important to lay out the arguments now mm -hmm. And as part of that, I say, actually, this crisis is not over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, that's the way that... Yeah, 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 I yeah. Think. I mean, so, that, so they're, they're two different questions, right? So the, the question is, is the next the next time everything implodes, what should we do? Um, and it's... What and we've been saying that we should have been doing for 30 years. Right, but then, but then the, the point is, in terms of the actual kind of ordering of, 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 of what you're doing, I think, would, would kind of differ. You can't... You, you need to... I think, I think you do need to have a separate... Um, implementation strategy and general kind of proposal um, so what I'm the question I'm trying to answer is um, when 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 you have the crisis and things are imploding uh, what should you do and, and this is an incredibly historical thing uh, exercise that I'm engaged in and then it's a different question about from today what, what should we do to try and make to try and make sure that we have an environment more conducive to some of these ideas um, uh, so I applaud kind of you know what um, Doug Carswell and Steve Baker are doing because they're you know they're saying okay from now going forward how are we going to try and I make this more likely <laughs> possibly, we'll possibly. Um, but it was but it was very much the, the kind of the proposal that I wanted to do was say okay that yeah we need we need people doing that and we need to we need to have a big debate about um, about what we should do going forward but having having said that there's also a danger there's also a downside risk to that which is that as soon as we start talking about some of these uh, these issues they become untenable um, because we may not win those arguments. Um, and and my um, so my, my background is doing um, uh, research on on radical um, policy in, in Eastern Europe, um, and what you can find there is that often cases the the countries that had the least public discussion of, of policies 
um, were the ones most likely to adopt radical reforms. Um, because when the crisis hit, um, there was a, a void. Um, and so people kind of latched on to, that, latched on to, to, to coherent plans um, that, that fitted, yes, with their kind of possible ideological priors. Um, but because these ideas are radical, uh, if you if you float them if you float them and have a big public debate, it, that's something I would encourage. But I would I would strongly suggest, uh, or I'd be concerned um, that if you did have a big public debate about eradicating deposit insurance and abolishing the, the Bank of England, um, then they would almost become untenable, and you'd weaken the possibility that you could implement them in a crisis. Us to keep quiet. Um, I wouldn't encourage us to keep quiet, but I, but I'd certainly say that. You um, must follow it. Mm, from what we just said, yes, yes. I think it's a, it's a, it should be a, it should be a consideration. I think I think that it, I, I wouldn't follow it, but I think that we could, you, you can always look back and say this is the conspiracy theory, right? That that we have all these ideas, and then in a crisis, the politicians kind of meet their kind of underground folks that gives them the plans and they adopt them and everything. Um, you know, I don't think that holds empirically, but I think that we'd be more likely to adopt radical policy if that was true. Um, perhaps that's why. That, perhaps that's why we. Unsuccessful. (laughs) I'm not sure actually that politicians would adopt this kind of policies in in a crisis unless uh, you know the um, the state itself was uh, was broke. Because um, I don't see a politician in time of crisis saying we are not going to act and we are going to let the market act. Mm -hmm. That is not what politicians do. I mean, because that would like shooting themselves in, in uh, both feet. Yep. So, um, on the other hand, I think that um, insurance, uh, deposit insurance, is a good thing. And not necessarily, the problem is not deposit insurance, the problem is that it is provided by the state. But I think that you could have a market for deposit insurance, yep. and the premiums would be more or less linked, I would say, with competition and so on, yep. to the rate you would charge for 100% custody. Mm-hmm. So either p- people could say, well, either I'm paying my bank, whatever it is, half a percent a year, for custody, or I'm paying an insurance company for you know, half a percent of whatever it is, yep. to give me insurance yep. up to whatever yep. it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that would be the, the, the trade-off. And yep. then I'm getting, you know, 2% or something yep. like that interest on my deposit. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. I think that it's kind of, I, I should make it more explicit, but it's implicit in my argument that when I use deposit insurance, I am specifically talking about um, taxpayer subsidized deposit yeah. insurance mm-hmm. um, so yes private deposit I don't know you know private deposit insurance I think would be a, would, would is probably an innovative financial a, a good financial innovation um, and you, you're quite right that that might therefore make it more likely if um, that, that, that you don't necessarily need to have a, a strictly 100% reserved account if you've got deposit insurance um, the interesting question then is that one of the common arguments against um, against fractional reserve banks um, is that is that in order to have a fractionally reserved bank, you need to essentially be exempt from normal um, business law because you're not keeping your creditors whole, and that the banking industry have these kind of curious ways in which they can get around auditing requirements that any other business can't do. Um, but then, when you have the debate between, so the so when you use insurance company examples of how they don't necessarily keep their current creditors whole because they're still, you know, taking a position that s- subsequent events might mean they get wiped out and they're not fully backed for that so there is there's you know they're taking this risk position um the argument tends to be well insurance companies are always by definition you know 100 percent whole and keep their creditors whole but banks don't mm. um so the interesting thing for me is if you have deposit in private deposit insurance and you have an insurance company that's that's insuring the hundred the, the fractional reserve funds then it kind of to me it blows up the argument about 100 percent reserve banks being being necessity mm. um so no I, I would encourage that and i think another another avenue um, is is to um, possibly, and this is something. This is a gradual policy idea. Is to say, let's try and create some kind of um, private um, deposit insurance program. I mean, there are private deposit insurance programs because deposit insurance existed before it was tax payer funded, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, when I looked at um, when I when I was looking at Lloyd's TSB accounts, um, and it said, you know, their their deposit their deposit insurance is through. Um, I forget the name of the particular um, financial services um, organisation, but that is an industry-funded organisation, and to be sure, it's heavily regulated. Um, but it's not 
necessarily taxpayer funded. I don't know the account, the specific accounts at which that is applicable and which ones it isn't. Um, but I think there's a fairly easy step to move from that. So you're quite right, one possible way of doing that. Um, now, something that we could all be working on is to try and make sure that, 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 that the you know, private um, deposit insurance is seen as a more viable alternative so that we don't just withdraw insurance immediately and, and have to wait for that to, to emerge spontaneously and privately. Um, so yeah, that's a very good point. Um, well, you, you said that um, you, your, your talk was uh, from the work of Professor Givindo. I seem to remember that he, he made some proposal to recapitalize, recapitalize the banks that were going bankrupt. Um, could you explain this a bit? Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I mean, in, in his um, in his plan, he's talking about um, you know about in the same way that if a normal company is going bankrupt, then it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it dies and everybody loses all of their money. You may find a way to recapitalise it into 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 some some people some some shareholders are going to take a loss, but you can find a way to recapitalise it. And I think that's what he's talking about. Okay, I mean. For, for me, I think that I think that we need to be thinking seriously about how to recapitalise the banks, and our our present way of doing that is through um, bailouts, right? So we we, we use tax um, tax funded money to bail out banks as our way of recapitalising them, or we use quantitative easing, which is essentially a, you know a free lunch for the, for the banks to re repair their balance sheet without actually doing anything to help the wider economy. Um, personally, I think that the alternative way to recapitalise banks is through deposits. Right. So, how do we want? You know, if we want banks to be able to lend more money to businesses, then you want them to be able to take more money in as deposits. And the only way to do that is, is for interest rates to go up. So, I, I think interest rates do need to go up. And if they do, then you are, you're going to get increased deposits, which which are then a form a form of recapitalisation. Um, but you know, recapitalise based on voluntary savings, not based on on, on taxpayer bailouts. Mm. Uh, yeah, I wanted if if banks did have to offer um, sort of 100% deposit accounts, um, how many, how many, what percentage of people could do that before they would basically have no money? Because they obviously don't have, they don't have all the money that is held on deposit at the moment. Mm -hmm. wouldn't, it, wouldn't it only take quite a small number of people to opt for that? Yeah. 100%. Um, um. So in in terms of um in terms of actual kind of reform proposals to, uh, to seriously implement it, um. Um, uh, Jesus Huerta de Soto um, basically advocates that you, you you print the cash required in order to be able to do that. Um, so what you do is you 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 essentially replace demand you know, electronic demand deposits with the the the, the cash value with that. Um, and he would argue that's not inflationary because you're 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 replacing one component of the money supply with another component of the money supply. Um, but you would need to have the central bank print that so that you can have that. Um, so you know, you, I think that it's a well taken point. But then that, I think that's how they would respond to it. Just the, the following one. Yeah. I mean, what, how much attention do you pay to what goes on in America? Because uh, whereas in this country, I've never seen anybody with a placard saying "End the Bank of England." I've seen plenty of people in America. So do you think that there is hope that that we will learn something from our, our cousins on the other side of the Atlantic? Um, you know, I, 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 so I'm an Austrian school economist, and I think that the financial crisis is the second revival in Austrian economics, and, and this is a real, op, you know, we're going to increasingly see Austrian ideas kind of take over. And, and, and if you look at the US, um, it was the financial crisis that meant that Ron Paul in particular and Peter Schiff, you know, their reputations, you know, just boost exponentially increased. Um, and we don't have similar, we don't have the same figures in the UK um, and, and they, you know, they are the, the focal points of, the, of those movements. Um, I think that, you know, someone like Steve Baker, um, you know, I don't, I don't think he differs a great deal in, in, in terms of um, ideas to, to someone like Ron Paul. He doesn't quite have the, you know, public awareness that Ron Paul does. Um, you know, but we're kind of getting there because, you know, at least, you know, two years ago we had no, I don't think we, there was a single politician that would openly propose that we end, you know, we, we abolish the Bank of England. Um, and I think kind of, you know, Steve, Steve makes those sorts of noises. Um, so that, I think that's a really encouraging sign. But um, I don't, I, I, I mean, I, I, I guess it's, it feeds into a kind of a broader kind of cultural issue, right? We don't really have a, 
a Tea Party movement um, in the UK in the same way that they do in the US. We, we had a kind of, you know, British people are prone to, you know, campaign against taxes. I'm thinking of the poll tax in particular, right? So, that, you know, we do, you know, it's not like we just kind of sit there and take it on the chin and everything. We, you know, we can get, you know, get, get worked up about stuff. Um, but we don't really have a tea, tea Party equivalent. We don't really have an End the Fed equivalent. Um, I'm not, I think it's probably a, possibly some cultural reasons for that, but it's, I think it's a shame. I think that, um, you know, I think it would be good if we could galvanise a bit of support for that and it become a lot more commonplace for people to, to be part of a, an honest money or a sound money movement um, and to, you know, and to have that as a... Sl- I mean, end the Fed, Fed is a nice slogan. End the Bank of England isn't quite nice. We need to think of, you know, think of a slogan or a catchphrase or something. Yeah. Oliver? I'm sorry. <laughs> Anthony, you said you've given this talk... <clears throat> To a number of different groups, I just wonder what kind of response you can feedback you've got from from different groups. I mean, Detlev Schlechter gave a talk last month along the same lines, and he's worked in the city for almost 20 years, and he says that people in the city just don't get Austrian economics, or very, very few do. So what chance have we got to explain Austrian economics to politicians or let alone the public? Mm. Um, In America, it's more... Uh, from behind said that, uh, that you know you do get a, 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 there is a strong anarchism movement over there and they start the agorism movement trading in silver themselves uh, saying that we're not going to have a political group we're going to do this um, so there is a strong movement over there but what, what feedback have you got on, on your ideas from this? Um, so I think there's, there's two different kind of things here there's the, there's the general kind of Austrian school economics and then there's you know the, the kind of specific um, you know proposal um, and again, this is a vanity exercise in that in that I'm not, you know, I, I, I present this as a way to try and provoke prompt debate and, and, and get people to think about how we might move to a free banking environment. But really, this is a vanity exercise in that the next time there's a financial crisis, I want to be able to sit back smugly and think, well, if they'd listened to me, you know, they could have listened to me, but they chose not to. And, you know, that's basically my motivation for doing that is just to be able to smugly say that um, and, and feel as though, you know, that there was an option to listen to me, but they chose not to. I don't have any expectation that anyone will listen to me, but just to, you know, just to make sure that, that they're doing that, that, there's no, that they can't come back and say, well, you know, what was your idea? You didn't have anything, you know, you didn't have a proposal yourself. In terms of the general Austrian movement, um, I think there's a lot of Aust- uh, a lot of latent Austrianism in the in the city. Um, so I have a presentation which is um, I take a Mark Scanson pamphlet which he wrote in 1988, which is this which is essentially the stylized facts facts of an Austrian boom bust cycle, um, and it's kind of bullet point what you'd expect to see at each phase of the cycle, and I just go through that and I've got charts showing whichever market it is at each phase. So when it says that you know at the boom phase, um, you know producer prices will rise faster than consumer prices. So I just show a chart showing producer price index, consumer price index at that time period. There will be a stock market boom, show the FTSE 100. Interest rates will spike upwards, LIBOR. And, and, and I just do, you know, I, I go, for me it's incredibly compelling and I think we've just experienced an Austrian boom. Um, and when I kind of, when I, you know, when I, I presented that to a few different audiences um, and there's some people that I think are self-taught and they're too, they understand the Austrian business cycle theory. Um, they understand the problems in the in the banking system. They're too busy making money to, you know, give talks about it and to be write books about it and do other things like that. There's also some who are f- kind of familiar with it, and then this financial this experience has made them really think about it because they kind of. Um, Steve Steve Baker is one. If you ask Steve about how he got into Austrian economics, he was familiar with it. He saw the dot com boom and thought, you know, this kind of fits in with an Austrian-type theory. And then he says he kind of forgot about it because he assumed that, you know, everyone else was onto that and would be aware of it and that, you know, we'd learn from that and not do the same mistake again. And then he saw the housing boom and thought, hang on a minute, this is the exact same thing going on again. And that's what kind of convinced him that he needed to to do something about it and to really kind of um, to look at it. And I think there's a lot of people like him who were kind of broadly familiar with the with the Austrian story um, probably downplayed it a bit much. Possibly got kind of sucked into the great moderation theory and thought that you know everything was fine and the you know the, the general exuberance of that time. Um, and now kind of sit back and say I should have I should have given that a lot more attention. Um, and so there is a, a lot of latent latent Austrianism that 
um, um, that, that, that I think are out there, and 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 these ideas I think are going to become increasingly increasingly prominent. Um, in terms of like kind of strategy, um, you know, I, th- I think you want to engage on as many fronts as possible. So anyone that's willing to listen, whether it's if it's politician, if they're willing to listen, I think we talk to them. If they're not, then we don't. Then, you know, we concentrate efforts elsewhere. Um, so you can kind of buy and sell um, silver and stuff, but then you know, I think. The, the funds that have been making the most money recently, um, you know, if you look at what they've been investing in, they, that's perfectly consistent with an Austrian story. And I actually, I actually believe that a lot of them do that explicitly. So I think you know, a lot of a lot of them read Austrian books and, and use and, and use that. Um, I've got a working paper which is um, about who kind of predicted the crisis, and I think people, some people did predict the crisis, mm. and you know, the evidence that I've found is that, funnily enough, it's the same people that predicted the dot com. Boom, um, and 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 you know they 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 come from a relatively Austrian background. Right. Uh, David first, then Gavin, then David. Of course, it, the one thing that you missed out from your talk, which it might be said is the single most important thing that we can be heard to say, is that if we are right, then the crisis is not over. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. So some, hence, hence, let's get let's get. Some of uh, what you said sort of sounded as though well, the crisis is over, and now we're going to wait for the next one in eight years' time. But I, I mean, it, 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 if we are right, yeah. then what's been done yeah. over the last two years in response yeah. to 2008 is the worst possible thing to do. Yeah. And is going to make the next crisis even worse than this one, and probably the gap between the crises yeah. will come down as well. Yeah, I think I think that um, generally speaking, the crisis there's you, you never have separate crises, right? So I think there's an incredibly powerful narrative which is not a distinctly Austrian story. I think this is mainstream mainstream economics and accepted by the you know the the, the best economy, you know, the, the the most famous mainstream economist um, is that you've got the you know you've got the dot com. Um, uh, you got the dot com boom. Um, before that, you had you know Russia and, and and things like that, and 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 you know you've got capital. The, the metaphor I use is an airbed analogy. So you pump the airbed full of air, it creates a bubble. You know when that bubble bursts, it never does burst. Truly, all you, all that happens is that it kind of spreads somewhere else. So we we had the dot com boom, and then rather than let that burst, we created a housing boom. And then now, rather than that, that burst, we're now having an emerging markets boom, or possibly a gilts boom, or you know some other boom somewhere else that we still haven't identified yet. So we, you know, we're constantly lurching from one crisis to another. But having said that, I, I would say that rather than, um, I still think we are in the same crisis now. We haven't we haven't had a crisis, and now we're going to at some future point have another crisis. Um, I think historically we will look back on, on on today and view it as you know, and this is a point I've made on a number of occasions. If things now feel as though they've calmed down a little bit, it's more likely to be the eye of the storm rather than the storm has passed. So I think it's very important that all Austrian school economists and 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 free market economists generally, um, whether you're economist or not, are. Are, are positioning themselves such that we can say, "I told you so," and this is more evidence for why you should have listened to us. If we're right, if we're right, this is Steve Baker um, says. What we, uh, you know, what should I, you know, how as as a coalition government, what should we, you know, say if there's a double dip, you know, if there's a double dip recession, then you know, how can we kind of get over that? Because the public are going to quite rightly, you know, um, be up in arms and everything. I said that you know I think the best thing to do is to assume that's going to be the case, and therefore not be too triumphant, triumphalist about um, about the recovery that we seem to be experiencing at the moment. Don't don't get carried away, because <laughs> whatever we say now about growth prospects, I think can very easily come back to to to, her, to harm us. Gavin, what I was going to say is that. Uh We've been members of the European Union for quite a long time now, and they do a lot of other nonsense, you know, small petty things and all that stuff. But they, ideally, they should have taken sole responsibility for all the European Union countries to how to control banking and things of like that. They should have taken much, much, much more responsibility. But they will need you on their responsibility. See there. So, to my mind, we are coming to a time 
when Britain now has to decide whether, you know, given all the things, yeah. the pros and cons, they have to decide whether they really worth staying within the European Union or come out altogether. I'm trying to form a, a group of people, Eurosceptics, yeah. to come out all together and renegotiate the trade agreement. Ideally, we don't need the European Union mm -hmm. because we're members of the G8 mm -hmm. and we get all the facilities from the G8. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make very strong this in the New Year's. Mm -hmm. I'll spend the whole year mm -hmm. devoting time to writing to all the Eurosceptic MPs and other important people mm -hmm. to come out once and all from the European Union. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think it raises the issue about kind of governance and, and the level at which you should have um, governance. So in the banking in the banking industry, um, I think I think that you could I think that I think that it's po you know it's theoretically possible that the EU could be used as a way of of, of, of improving the banking system across you Europe. Have done it long term ago. But um, you know, I, I think that if you if you if you ref, if you put your hopes in in higher level governance institutions, then all you're doing is increasing the risks of of getting that wrong and having greater effects. So I'd I'd rather that we had more localized experimentation in banking systems, and that we had we had more different banking systems. Um, so and, and some banking systems that can fail, and we can learn the lessons from that, um, rather rather than try and kind of coordinate and, and have a one size fits all. That's the problem with the EU. Is that you know the whole point of the EU is that it's one size fits all. Yes, we know that we will have different if kind Australia of. Australia and New Zealand can have such efficiency in their yeah. banking system. I don't see why we, uh, a much bigger country e economically, yeah. or even G Germany has got very efficient ideas, mm -hmm. right? And this, but even they tied their hands are tied up. You see. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean we're certainly learning a lot about EU from the um, from the from the crisis. And again, talking about eye of the storm, the the situation with Greece, I think, is um, again that's that's about to come back and and and, and by we, we, you know we've not we've not we've not put that behind us. Um, what I mean, we talk about res, uh, fractional reserve banking, and uh, very often when you, one of the objections to to have uh, no fractional reserve banking is said there'd be no credits. Mm -hmm. And indeed, if for what if we Impose hundred percent reserve mm -hmm. for a while. There'll be no more credits, mm -hmm. which is going to make the economy really bad. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Um, so, so some of the propose some of the proposals for hundred percent reserve banking are, 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 are attempting to kind of freeze the current money supply so that you don't see a massive um, a massive decline in uh, monetary contraction. Um, I think that certainly. Fractional reserve banking in, uh, increases um, credit um, over and above what the amount of credit that would exist in a 100% reserve system. Um, now, the issue with that is, I think we all know that the the, the, the amount of credit and the amount, the, the, you know, the overall money supply doesn't determine economic activity in, in the in the long run. It doesn't really matter what the money supply is. What really matters, what I'm more interested in is, is is how that how it changes and how the effects of it changes affects the real economy. Um, but you know, at the at the end of the day it doesn't matter whether or not the money supply is, you know, fifty trillion pounds or five trillion pounds, it makes no difference. Quite right, but when you stop the when you stop it um, there's a change. Yeah. So wait, so so I think the 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 issue here is um, which is a, a slightly more kind of technical debate, which is how we define inflation, um, because people that tend to favour fractional reserves would define inflation as being when the demand for money, uh, sorry, when the supply of money exceeds the demand for money, and it's only it's only in that condition when you start to see excess credit creation um, and the kind of the boom bust cycle take place. Um, Hundred percent reserves tend to define inflation as just the money supply. Um, so I think that you've got kind of the, the fractional reserve argument is that the you know the, the money supply will expand not as much as it would under a fiat a fractional reserve system, um, but more so than it would under a 100% reserve system. And I think you know it's a serious consideration that there would be less credit available. Um, I think we need to have less credit available because the whole problem in the financial crisis was there was too much credit available. So we need we need to have a you know the 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 the, the economy. Would be would be better managed, and it would run more smoothly uh, if there was a, a credit, if there was less credit available, and it was more difficult to borrow money. Yes, but that's when it's stabilised. But 
for banks to increase the reserve, there will be a period during which there is no credit at all because they need to increase their reserves. Mm -hmm. And during that period, you, you may create a huge crisis. Yeah, but I, but again, as the, the point made out, I think that um, many of those proposals would would print the cash to to match the current demand deposits, so that you'd replace certain types of money with other types of money, so that you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily have that 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 immediate contraction as you implement the one hundred percent reserve system. So th I think they take that seriously, and they 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 try and have a mechanism by which you wouldn't see a massive overnight de um, decline in credit. There are some people that advocate 100% reserve arguments that say we want a big monetary contraction because we've got all of this additional, you know, we've got all, all of this bad investment and we want to liquidate it. So it's a good thing to have a big deflation and clear everything out and have another kind of great depression so that we can then start from scratch again. Um, you, have, you have other people that say, well, it, that's not necessary. We, we, can, we can freeze the money supply now and just have 100% reserves going forward. Um, and then you have other fractional reserve people that will say, Freeze the money supply, but then allow private banks to extend credit as they think it. You know, it, it, it matches with the demand for money. Um, but it, certainly, any kind of free market system would there would be there would be less credit available, and it would be harder to get credit than than currently. And that's a real challenge that we have. Um, you know, because because it's politically popular to have low interest rates and and to to be able to borrow money easily. The problem is people don't understand that the, you know the cost of that is periodic crises. Um, so yeah, David, uh, it seems churlish to uh, criticise people like uh, uh, Stephen Baker and Douglas Carswell and their help because after all, it's it's very nice to see conservative MPs who are libertarian inclined. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have real problems with the. Carswell bill. I mean, obviously, it's not going to become law. It's a five-minute rule bill. It's a piece of propaganda. What concerns me is that actually is, is this actually a bad piece of propaganda? Because I think it uh, it, uh, it 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 hits all of the cranky buttons. One of the problems that I have always had uh, with part of the Austrian school is the obsession with the fractional reserve banking debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the arguments are just wrong. I mean, the argument that it's unlawful, that it's fraud, all that kind of just nonsense. And anybody who knows anything about law uh, will know that it's nonsense. Uh, and yet what we see with the Carlswell Bill is an overwhelming focus on precisely that. Mm -hmm. So we get a focus on what is not, I think, the real problem, because the problem is not fractional reserve banking, the problem is government support yep. for banks mm. that enables reserve ratios that would exceed those that would exist on a free market, mm -hmm. and therefore more credit than would exist on a free market. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not fractional reserve banking as such, mm -hmm. which would always exist on a free market to some extent. Yep. The second problem is uh, the, uh, I think you identified this, and I think at one point you criticised it, but then at another point you actually uh, endorsed it is the notion of mandating banks to create certain kinds of accounts and not have other kinds of banks and not have other kinds of accounts and provide information, etc., etc., etc. And I'm against that as well because yeah. I think that sets a very bad example of the idea of the and even allowing for the fact that these banks are really semi-state entities anyway, even allowing because then I think it sets a bad example. And the third point is that it's just absurd nonsense anyway because nobody in their right mind is going to uh, is going to uh, well I sort of view people if you want to put your cash into a bank and keep it safe the facility already exists it's called a safety deposit box it's mm -hmm. there already so the idea that you have to mandate these accounts which nobody will use because if, if you've got a choice between three and a half percent on deposit uh, or minus a half percent on a deposit hundred percent fractional reserve very, very few people, except maybe for overnight, mm -hmm. might go down that route anyway. So I, I, I've got real problems with it. But my real concern is the first one. I just think it sounds cranky. I think it doesn't really focus on what the real problems are, which is state support for the banks, yeah. excess regulation, barriers to entry, yeah. uh, the, et cetera, et cetera. The, 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 prob the, pro the, the problem is that it, you know, it's an issue that divides the, um, the Austrian school and, and, and libertarian thought on this. Um, my, my approach um, 
is that I think that you you I think that there's there, there's a possibility that you can find um, a proposal that that both sides could buy into, and that will increase the chances of it gaining legitimacy. Um, so it doesn't really matter what side you kind of fall on. I think I think you uh, to me it's about finding that kind of the the the, the common ground that kind of. And this is why I kind of say, man, that's why I have the mandate bits, which isn't in Kevin's plan, but that's my attempt to try abolish and get those guys on board. England, for example, a bill to abolish the Bank of England, that would be, that would strike at the heart of it. Again, it won't pass. But if you, if you want to get a propaganda message, it's a lot more effective than piddling around. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 was, very, I was disappointed that, 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 you know, the outcome of that bill was, it certainly seemed that they were, they were going against um, fractional reserve lending. I think that if you, if you, I, I don't think that was necessarily the, the main intention. I think they would argue that that was one kind of component of it, and 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 certainly the, the critique that I made was the kind of the paternalism aspect. And I think that's what they've kind of you know possibly latched onto a little bit, which is that we're trying to protect people and you know custodial accounts and and, and things like that are, are, are essentially a form of consumer protection. Um, I think they view it as a, I think Doug Carswell in particular views it as a consumer protection bill. Um, now it's going for a second reading. I'm hopeful that um, it will be a bit more kind of balanced in that regard, um, and, and, and that it might be a little bit more kind of, you know, I think it's too much in the 100% reserve group, and it might move back so that it, it can kind of mediate a little bit, um, a little bit better. Um, but no, I mean, I, I kind of I, I agree with you that I, I, I was disappointed that it seemed to be it seemed to be going after the wrong the wrong thing. Um, and that it needs to go after, you know, to me, deposit insurance is, is the is the is the way into it, and is the way to strike the debate. Um, but then, you know, they're taking it seriously, so that you know, the, the end point. I, th I think as well is that they are thinking um, in terms of transition process and what is what's what's most likely to kind of. Um, there is an issue about feasibility, and we could say, well, you know, the, the whole thing is completely unfeasible anyway, so we may as well just be controversial. But then they are thinking about feasibility as being an issue and then and then and then a kind of step by step process which I think in their in their view would possibly end up in a fairly similar place to where um where you know I think we'd want to end up. But I think they you know they have a different route there. Um and you know that that you know that uh, fortunately that that is that is the job of the politician, right? It's it's for the kind of the economists and the academics and the philosophers to say um you know this is what we want. And then it's up to those guys to kind of manage the interest groups and and create the rhetoric by which we can get there. Um, so we'll see. Is there any other speaker? My goodness, you've reduced them to silence. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. <laughs> Pleasure, thank you.